All right, good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the April 28th Community Mental Health Full Board Meeting. Uh, before we get started with roll call, um, the Macomb County Community Mental Health family lost a member recently, um, Jennifer Serrani, and um, I really just wanted to take a moment of silence in remembrance of her and all of her hard work that she did for Macomb County Community Health and, and the people that we serve. So uh, I'd like to observe a quick moment of silence for her. Thank you, everyone. Next, I will turn it over to Sandy if she is ready for the roll call. I sure am. Okay, Megan. Megan Burke attending virtually from Chesterfield Township, Macomb County, Michigan. Uh, Linda. Linda, you're on mute. I thought Dave did that to me. Um, <laughs> Linda Bush attending virtually from Harrison Township, Michigan in Macomb County. Ryan. Ryan Fantuzzi attending virtually in Clinton Township, Michigan, Macomb County. I don't believe Nick is on. No. Okay, Dana. Good evening, everyone. Dana Freer is attending virtually from Fraser, Macomb County, Michigan. Phil. Phil Kraft attending remotely from Chesterfield Township, Macomb County, Michigan. Mark. Mark Kilgore attending remotely from East Point, Michigan, Macomb County. Uh, is Dr. O'Connell on? No. Okay, Lori. Lori Phillips attending remotely from Macomb, Michigan, Macomb County. Selena. Selena Schmidt attending remotely from Shelby Township, Michigan, Macomb County. And Antoinette. Antoinette Wallace attended remotely from Mount Clemens, Macomb County, Michigan. That concludes the list, Phil. Thank you, Sandy. All right, next we will be doing the Pledge of Allegiance and Ryan is going to lead us in that. Everybody please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America. and to the Republic in which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God. with liberty, liberty and, and justice for all. For all. Thank you, Ryan. Next, I will read our mission statement. Macomb County Community Mental Health, guided by the values, strengths, and informed choices of the people we serve, provides quality services which promote recovery, community participation, self-sufficiency, and independence. Uh, next item is the adoption of the agenda. I'll take a motion to adopt. So moved. Or support, Burke. Motion from Ryan, support from Megan. Any comments or questions on the agenda? All right, hearing and seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? The agenda is adopted. Next is hearing of the public. Anybody from the public wishing to speak on any agenda item, you have five minutes. Um, just give us your name and address. Um, and if you are <laughs> muted, unmute yourself. Uh, raise your hand. Um, you can just jump in and say your name, and I'll try to take you in the order in which I hear you. Hearing of the public, first call. Hearing of the public going twice. Third and final call for hearing of the public. All right, hearing and seeing none, there is another opportunity right before the end of the meeting. So I will close the first hearing of the public and move on to item 5A, approval of the minutes of the CMH full board meeting held on March 24th, 2021. I'll take a motion to approve. So moved. Support, Bush. Motion from Dana, support from Linda. Any questions or comments on the minutes? 
All right, hearing and seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. All right, next is item six, approval of standing committee meeting minutes and recommendations. We'll go to 6A, approval of the minutes of the nominating committee meeting held on April 23rd, 2021. We'll start with a motion to approve the minutes and then we'll move on to the action item. So moved, Burke. Support, Philip. Motion from Megan, support from Lori. Any question on the minutes before we move on? All right, hearing and seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? The minutes are approved. Next is the recommended candidates for CMH board officers. For this one, I will turn this over to Linda. It's my pleasure. Good evening, everyone. The uh, nominations committee met last Friday and um, we, had, we considered all the nominations that had been received as of that date. And um, we voted and proposed the slate that you have in your packet. The officers and the people nominated, the offices and people nominated are chairperson, Phil Kraft, Vice Chair, Selena Schmidt, Secretary Treasurer, Linda Bush, uh, all three are um, we're very honored to be nominated and all three have accepted. So now uh, there is the possibility of, ex there is uh, the opportunity to accept nominations from the floor. So are there any nominations, other nominations from the floor? Any other nominations from the floor? And third time, are any other nominations from the floor? So this is the slate. Um, we can uh, vote for all three together or you can um, move to separate them. Um, that's your pleasure. Looking for um, a motion to approve this. Slate as presented. I support. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the, uh, great, thank you. The, um, <laughs> The uh, election is effective immediately. And so Phil, I want you to take the gavel from your left hand and put it in your right hand. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. I'll just continue cruising on with the meeting. Um, <laughs> Nick, are you? Yeah, I just, wanted, just wanted to let you know I was here. Do you want to do your roll call real quick? Oh, Nick Schumantero, uh, attending remotely from Roseville, Macomb County, Michigan. Perfect. Thank you, Nick. You just missed the vote for the officers. <laughs> no, I, was, I got on in time for that. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Next, we will move on to item 6B, approval of the minutes of the program and budget committee meeting held on April 14th, 2021. I'll take a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Support, Schmidt. Motion from Nick, support from Selena. Any questions or comments? All right. Hearing and seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. All right, next is item seven, request to approve. Uh, previously, we approved or we moved forward item 7A through E. I would entertain a motion to approve those items unless anybody wanted to separate any of them. I have a question regarding um, always care. Okay, we can separate I thought that. that. Yeah, would you separate that please? Sure. Uh, I don't care if you separate them. I do have a question on a couple of them. Uh, we can take that as part of a big motion or a little motion. I don't, whatever your preference is, Mr. We'll just, Chair. <laughs> we'll just go, we'll go through one at a time. We'll keep it simple. Okay. So we'll start with 7A, a request to approve rate increase for all supported employment service providers. I'll take a motion to approve. Move to approve, Bush. Support, Support Schmidt. Bella. Motion from Linda, support from Selena. Questions or comments on this item? All right, hearing and seeing none. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. 
Next is item 7B, request approval to contract with Cornerstone 1 Inc, Cornerstone 2 Inc, Hernandez Home LLC, and Cornerstone AFC LLC. Take a motion to approve. Move to approve. Schmidt. Support. Motion from Selena. I didn't catch who support was from. Linda. 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 Okay. Nick, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, there were several questions that were raised at program and budget that uh, we were, we, somebody was, was checking on it. Christina, or uh, who was checking on? <laughs> Christina. Christina. <laughs> That's what I thought. Um, one was, uh, well, one, I just want to reconfirm that the fact that there's, that we're dealing with somebody with no accreditation is because this issue is an accredited, uh, the services they provided, so they wouldn't be accredited, but they are certified. I found that in there. And then there was a question concerning, um, whether or not they were for profit or not for profit. Um, I think those were the two main ones. Is Christina with us? Hi, Nick. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, I'm there you are. <laughs> You're correct in the, the first piece that it's not a requirement to have an accreditation, but they do have the specialized license so they can operate. They have the law license and then they are a for-profit company. Okay. Christina, just, yeah, I, you don't need to answer this now, but it's a question I had both for this and for expert care, which I believe was the other for-profit we're dealing with tonight. If at a later date, you can let us know what percentage of our providers are for-profit versus not-for-profit. And <laughs> if there's any difference in terms of the quality we receive. Yeah, we can pull that together for you. Thanks, appreciate it. Thanks, Nick. Any other questions on this item? All right, seeing and hearing none, we have a motion in support. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. All right, next is item C, request to expand always care contract to include supported employment services. I'll take a motion to approve. And I have a discussion on that topic, so. Okay. Move to approve. So Support Schmidt. Motion from Linda, support from Selena. Lori, go ahead. Yeah, I just have a question regarding the paperwork that was submitted with them. And um, I thought at the last meeting, I had asked for uh, emailed Sandy and she did send me, their board membership was from 2018 or 2017 to 2018. And um, she did send me the 2021, 20, 22, um, which is totally different. And um, I just had a question as to why um, they, I thought she sent it out to everybody. I don't know, but I just question why they are using in their paperwork a 2017, 2018 board and they are different people that are on presently. There's a couple that are the same, but they're also, I just, I just wanted an explanation. Why would they do that with this contract? Send us an incorrect document. Um, I don't know. And we should have shared that updated board list. I thought it was going out with the, the packet to all board members. We'll make sure everybody gets it. Christina, do you have any feedback. If not, we'll just follow up with the provider. No, that was it that I did reach out to them that day to get an updated list. And so if um, I can double check that with always care to make sure we have the correct information and, and follow up again. Thank you. <laughs> Sandy did send out a reminder yesterday and it did have the updated list in an email. So every board member should have it. If you don't let Sandy know. Okay. Thank you. Any other board members with questions or comments? I have a question. Dana, go ahead. Is this um, is this in response to the RFP for supported employment, or is this something separate? This there was an urgent need uh, for a referral, so we went ahead and um, 
based on that, we'd like to do the contract with Always Care ahead of the expanded RFP that will go out. We have a, a large need for additional supported employment providers. And they've been, historically, I talked to the, their CEO myself. They've been seeking, they, they have a contract with us, just not, it does not include supported employment. So this was a service addition to them. Um, the other ones will give us the opportunity to bring in brand new providers um, who do supported employment. Okay, thank you. Yep. I have a question, Phil. Go ahead, Linda. When they, when you do, um, I guess this is a sole source co contract and you probably have criteria. Is there a dollar amount on how much we can do for uh, that kind of situation? This is a fee for service, so there is no set dollar amount. Okay. Thanks, Linda. Any other board members with questions or comments? I, I do not, but I'm so sorry. I have a work emergency breaking out via text message right now. Can I just hop off for one second? I'll be right back. We'll be here. <laughs> you already Thanks. voted for Phil. It's okay. <laughs> the most important thing. Yeah, right. I think we have far more important things to deal with. <laughs> all right. Seeing and hearing no other questions or comments on this item, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Next is item 7D, request to expand the existing contract of expert care management for occupational, physical, and speech therapy services. I'll take a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Support Bush. Motion from Selena, support from Linda. Any board members have any questions or comments on this item? All right, seeing and hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Next is item E, approval of my care sublease agreement. Take a motion to approve. So moved, Frears. Support, Fantuzzi. Motion from Dana, support from Ryan. Selena, you had a question? Yeah, I have a question regarding um, this item that I asked at the budget meeting. Um, when we're looking at doing this and we have a, um, an agreement with the MyCare folks and we're offering them a place for them to conduct business in the agreement that they would care for our, our people, um, my question was is how often are they actually providing the service to our Macomb County residents that fall up underneath us. And I was wondering if anybody was able to tell us. Um, my concern was the last time we discussed this, they were seeing and providing services to very little of our consumers. <clears throat> and so I have a question. Through, through the chair, um, Selena, those are good questions. Um, historically too, when I started and first met the, the folks at my care, um, the, the numbers were smaller and there was a kind of a reluctance or some referral issues, um, which our CCBHC grant is now helping to overcome. So we are very much 100% focused on integrated healthcare. We currently share 124 people. Um, that took a little uh, back and forth between us. Um, but we're working to have a uh, ongoing tracking system in place. In addition to that, um, they're a COVID-19 vaccination site. And with their help and partnership, we were able to vaccinate uh, 80 people with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, this month. Um, I think we're on target for another 80 spots uh, with a goal of 120 um, going forward. Um, so it's, it's a growing collaboration um, and we expect those numbers to actually start to increase even more significantly going forward. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you staying on top of it and to hold them into accountable to really do a true integration for our folks. We meet every Friday afternoon for our CCBHC and their staff participates and we're working very closely 
Uh, it's a very good partnership right now. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, so, and Nick, go ahead. Yeah, yeah as I reviewed the, the uh, contracts, again, I noticed that there is a specific addendum that talks about additional consideration, which are the services they're supposed to be providing uh, to, our, to our consumers. Um, and they're pretty specific, including some that deal with providing service to people who do not have insurance. Uh, it also allows them to bill for Medicaid and Healthy Michigan, et cetera, et cetera. So the, that's really not a gift that's a, a to us. But, you know, it's a good thing because of the coordination. And a lot of the rest talks about the coordination between health, uh, between physical health and behavioral health. And that's really why we're doing it, which is a good thing. Uh, I just would like to see if we can't get a breakdown of the numbers in from that addendum or use that addendum sort of as a template for uh, reporting on what they're actually providing us. I just wanted to bring that to your attention, David. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Any other board members with questions or comments on this item? All right, hearing and seeing none. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Next is item 7F, which is a new item, Suicide Prevention Lifeline Planning 2021 Part 1. I'll take a motion to approve. Move to, move, uh, to support. Support uh, Wallace. Motion from Ryan, support from Antoinette. Dave, go ahead. Uh, it's a small grant. Uh, <laughs> Ambrosia, do you have any detail you'd like to apply? To yes. <laughs> the, the, the literature that uh, we have today details a grant that was a non-competitive allocation awarded to ourselves and also four of the call centers in the state of Michigan to assist us with the transition for, uh, to 988 from 911 that will cover mental health emergencies. It is... Um, a task to reduce the amount of suicides in Michigan and the allocation is $5,000 and that is to cover um, what is required for statewide meetings and also data collection from our crisis department, crisis center uh, program actually. Thank you, Ambrosia. Absolutely. So Phil, if I could. Where is Phil? He looks frozen. <laughs> frozen. Nick, I anyway. just go ahead and talk, Nick. I get okay, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, did you want to? Did you have yeah, go ahead, Nick. I, I think Phil would say yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> the uh, Ambrosia, the it's only a five thousand dollar grant, so obviously it's not doing this. And our crisis center is now all live, and then the extra slack is taken by the suicide prevention hotline. I understand. So, is this a coordination program? As near as I can tell. Absolutely. I would consider it a bridge, if you will, um, between um, MDHHS and. Uh, the the other five the other four call centers. So in 2018, collaboratively we assisted with um, taking 17,321 calls. The $5,000 this year is allocated toward the state meetings and also data collection. That and so it will cover the extra time needed for staff to be uh, paid. Going forth, the state is right now working out um, a sustainable funding source with Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, better known as SAMHSA. So right now, what we are being asked to do is covered, um, is expected to be covered under the 5,000, along with the other four organizations, which in detail are Common Ground, Dial Help, Gripen Place, and Listening Ear Crisis Center, um, to cover time for meetings and also data collection. Gotcha. But Sustainability, absolutely going forward, it will, um, they are working to collaborate with SAMHSA for uh, sustainability, for funds for sustainability rather. Gotcha, thank you. Absolutely. 
Um, Phil has been kicked out, so I will be taking over. Um, Ryan, did you have a question? I do. Um, Ambrosia, what's the timeline on this? I, I love this idea of a hotline of, you know, rather than calling 911, calling 988. Uh, any idea? Of, I, I know we're not leading it, but what's the, what's the anticipated uh, rollout for this? The anticipated rollout is through, I believe, June 2022. My apologies that I can't give you the absolute specifics on that, no, um, cool. but I believe it's June th um, 2022. But we were um, selected along with the other four organizations because we agreed with the RFP to meet the 70% benchmark to take 70% of those calls. And um, so going forward, there will be a cushion in time and so uh, around June 22, we would think that things will be uh, folded, uh, unraveled, if you will, or, or incomplete, um, you know, going forth. I don't have a good adjective for it right now. My apologies. About a year. That's good. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what the data collection is for, to see how we can do it. Is there anything we can do? Um, I guess this is for both you and Dave, and both the Ambrosia and Dave, to speed that up, or is it just we? It, we're not uh, in control. I would say that we are not so much in control. Dave I, is the more important person, of, obviously, to answer the question. But I would say that we are not necessarily in control. We're on the state's timeline. And what we are in control of is kind of going with the timeline that they have set out for us. And so with the data collection, we will report out um, per the tool that they provide us along with the other four call centers. And they will look at the data, um, tweak it if, if needed, and, and then we'll go forth and see, um, you know, if what we are doing across the state, not even specific to Macomb County, but what we are doing across the state to, to monitor to see if it's efficacious. Yeah, Ryan, I sit on the 988 committee at the state. And the way that it is working right now is we're just in the um, development of what it's going to look like. You know, what is the, when you call 988, who's going to pick up, how they're going to be trained, what resources they're going to have, how are they going to partner with EMS and the police. So it, it is looking at, you know, we're hoping for June of next year, but we're also um, basing that upon our, our federal partners who also had approved the 988. So um, probably not until next summer. And, you know, I'm, I'm really excited that Macomb County was picked out of one of the four. Um, you know, I highly encourage them to be chosen. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Well, you know, th this is uh, to replace the current suicide prevention hotline or in addition? Yeah, so, so this, this is going to replace um, what we currently do. One of the um, things that I did bring up is that how do we get, how do we communicate this? Because right now we have some very successful crisis lines. And what is that going to look like? Are you going to, you know, like I, I said that the stakeholders, the CMHs needed to be pulled in as a stakeholder. You know, some of the CMHs have phenomenal crisis services. So that's when they went out and they reached out to the, you know, they put it out as for four um, to start getting them a little bit more involved in being it. But the goal is to have one number. But there's a, there's a crisis hotline that we have. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a 800 number national suicide prevention hotline that mm -hmm. well publicized. I mean, replacing yep. it with a 988 is good, but I'd hate to see somebody who calls one of those other two numbers not get connected. Well, there'll be a transition period. So it's not like, you know, 988 won't go up and everything else gets shut down. Right. So um, there'll be a transition period on when that goes. And then that what the, what the goal is is to have the other numbers direct them to, you know, nine eight eight. That's great. Okay. Yeah, I, I understand why it would take some time to get all those bugs worked out in the system. Although I would assume the national hotline can be helpful in because they've already developed a lot of those links, so mm -hmm. it it could be helpful in in deciding it, but it'll take some time. Yeah. Doesn't yes. Any other questions on that? I put the link to the listening session in the, the chat for everybody. 
Can you all see the email from Bob Sheehan on the screen? Yes. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. so you can follow the implementation. Uh, and we'll, we'll provide updates um, in this forum and stuff too. So thank you, Selena. Thank you, Ambrosia, very much. Thank you. Okay. No further questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, then we're gonna move on to item number eight, which is receiving file. Sandy, do we have any re receiving files? No, we're good. Okay, so we'll move on to item number nine, which is our resolution. And so we have two of our former board members tonight, which we are sad to see go, but very thankful for the service they provide and for the friendships that we've made along the way. I don't know if Brian or who has the resolutions. We have one for Tony. They're in the packet. We did read them at the program and budget. Okay. Okay. So do we just gonna, I don't even know what we, we what do we wanna do with them? Do we wanna present them? Do we want to, I found there they the are. Um, Tony is with us. There's, yep. So Tony, Thank you for your service. Um, we greatly appreciate everything that you've done for us and the wisdom and guidance that you've given us by being a part of our team and hope that we don't see the last of you. You will not see the last of me. <laughs> I intend to be hanging around someplace. I may even join these meetings. Uh, the other thing I can tell you first uh, uh, is uh, in reading this document, I was stunned and how well done it was. And I've got to give kudos to Lori Value because she really did some homework to pull this one together. And uh, for Pete's sake, it's all true. <laughs> anyway, I, it was a pleasure and I got a tremendous education from the whole system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Tony, for your nice words. <laughs> Thanks. And then the, we had the other one is for Brian, and who I don't believe is here today, um, who has been around for many years and has contributed tremendously. Um, and it'll be, you know, hopefully that he does the same thing as, you know, he doesn't become a forgotten part of our board. Um, and so there's a new one under resolutions for Dan DeCourse. And unfortunately, I don't know who Dan is. Uh, Anybody here that worked with Dan? Dave, this is Tracy Smith. I can jump in if you want. Uh, Dan DeCourse is a um, individual who's retiring from the county after many years of service. He was a case manager who did focus in forensic work. So his knowledge and experience will be greatly, greatly missed. We had a virtual retirement party for him. And of course, everybody said a lot of kind words. We did hit re at that time read him this resolution also. All right. Thank you, Tracy. So do I have a motion to file and receive these three resolutions? No. This is the motion to adopt. Um, is it to adopt or to receive and file? I think it's to adopt the resolutions. Okay. We adopted motion to, the program. Motion to adopt the three resolutions. So moved, Burke. Support. Any discussion, Adam? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Going on to item 10, the voucher of the listings of the bills to be paid. Motion, Motion to pay the bills. Support Bush. Thank you. Any discussion on them? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, any opposed? Motion carries. Bills coming back in. Okay. 
perfect. Um, item 11, the management report. Um, Richard, um, yes. we would like, uh, we'd like to propose a little, uh, some changes to the financial reporting. Richard, would you like to explain? Yeah, so um, just want to um, appreciate the board's patience. Um, some of you may have known that I had to go out on a family medical leave for a period of about a week and a half. And so running a little bit behind this month, um, I'd like to bring the February financial statements to the program and budget um, committee meeting on May 12th, I believe. And then the March financial statements will come uh, as regularly scheduled to the May 26th full board meeting, if, if that's acceptable. Any comments? I think that's Thanks. fine. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Phil, you want to take back over? I'm here. Where are we? <laughs> we <laughs> are on. <laughs> we're on the CEO update. I was chair for item 10 11. Minutes. I was chair for 10 minutes. I had to leave. Thank you. I got to chair <laughs> all in 10 minutes of being appointed vice chair. I apologize. Everything just shut down on me and I was freaking out. So thank you, Salita. Um, we are on to the CEO update, right? Good. Yes. Thank you. Dave, yeah, uh, go ahead. <laughs> um, so ahead of this meeting, I sent out a couple of emails to the board um, you should be aware of and should be tracking the uh, gearing towards integration. I'm pulling it up on my screen here. Um, so this document is being circulated at the in Lansing. It's another um, take at system redesign was the, the common terminology. Um, it, it's a continued effort to um, change the way the Medicaid dollars um, come down from the state and are distributed throughout um, down to the provider networks and stuff. Currently, those Medicaid dollars for behavioral health services come down to the 10 prepaid inpatient health plans. This plan calls, states it clearly in here, that the PIHPs would be eliminated to, repeat, uh, to be replaced by an SIP, which was the, the language uh, previously proposed by Director Gordon. So integration efforts continue. There, there was a 298 project that went on for quite some time that involved, I think, uh, three or four regions, counties here in Michigan, um, worked for a long time, then that went off the, the table. In its place was the, the redesign model that Director Gordon was proposing. The pandemic hit, um, all of those efforts came to a screeching halt. Um, but uh, their efforts continue in Lansing. This is primarily supported by the Medicaid health plans who are over the physical health and they get all those Medicaid dollars. We currently in Michigan operate under a carve out where the behavioral health services are funded separate. Um, and they would like to carve that back in. Um, so they calling this full integration. The Community Mental Health Association of Michigan is on record as being opposed to the uh, plan in its entirety, um, as are we. Um, we have invited Alan Bolter from the association to present uh, his updates to the board. Um, of course, uh, Bob Sheehan and Alan Bolter are tracking this very closely and providing us with very frequent updates. There's even a new update as of today where there's an associated, um, some legislature, legislation to the Social Welfare Act and the Mental Health Code as another effort to encourage this type of uh, integration and elimination of the redesign of the, the current system. Um, so 
Alan couldn't uh, come until June 6th. Um, that Sandy helped uh, find a time that was convenient for him and that would meet with our board schedule. Um, we could possibly find a date and time before that um, if the board was interested in holding a board study session. So there's that going on. Um, uh, Dave, Dave, before you move off this topic, I, I just have a comment that um, the health plans just for, you know, like we have so much jargon and so many terms, but the health plans are private, private for-profit corporations. So essentially this is privatizing our public mental health system, which could, which is why um, the association and us are opposed to it. So uh, it, it's been revisited. It used to be called 298. Um, uh, yeah, it's just a And it just doesn't go away. Our, the people we serve testified over and over at great effort to take their family members to testify, to tell them it's not the kind of, they don't want to lose their public system. They're, they're, of course, there's things that they also request to be improved about the public system, but uh, that they are opposed to this and it just keeps coming back. Yeah, and everybody's in agreement, I mean, the timing is horrible. We're in a pandemic, the, the community needs are spiking for mental health services and substance use services. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all kinds of bad. Um, like I said, it's happened before, it's gone away, but this is not something that we should just brush off and think that it's not going to go forward like the other ones. Um, it is a serious threat to our current system. Right. Um, and I'll, Dave, yes. Yeah, I just had uh, a couple of comments here. The Mental Health Association in Michigan had a meeting with Shirky's office, uh, with his staff, uh, to discuss this along with a coalition of advocacy groups. So there are a number of advocacy groups that are already involved in the debate. Uh, as you pointed out, it's now in it's now being offered as a uh, amendment to the Social Welfare Act. It's, I, I think there's boilerplate language being uh, offered as well. So we're, you, we are, Linda's absolutely right, we're back in the old fight. I haven't had a chance, I, in the spirit of, spirit of our new chairman, I was having computer problems <laughs> all day. So I just got a copy of the, um, uh, of the of the uh, the statutory proposed language, uh, so I haven't had a chance to review it yet. But I suspect we're back to starting again on uh, uh, on having this entire debate and trying to hold off what essentially would close down the public health system, public mental health system in the state. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a significant threat and they um you know when you when you read the gearing uh document you know there's some very nice words in there it's built on choice and person center planning but um as the analysis points out you know it says that it lists it but then there's no evidence of any of those elements actually in the plan so um one of the key problems with the private sector approach is that though they may commit to taking all comers, they rarely do. And this group, the, the mental health, I mean, the, uh, uh, the Michigan Health Association, the uh, various uh, parties are HMOs basically. And they uh, do not really have much experience uh, in not only in, they, they don't have experience in providing mental health services for the most part. They have absolutely no experience in providing the supports and the services that are so critical with that to go with that. So it, it's really a terrible idea. And the one good thing is that though it's coming back at us, we've had an opportunity to 
demonstrate how well the CMH wards uh, can work at uh, coordinating mental health and behavioral health uh, without disrupting this whole system, because that's a good goal. It's just not their, their way of reaching the goal is uh, totally impractical, very expensive, and, and uh, just wouldn't work, would cost a lot of people the services they need. Well, I think there's other things you have to take into consideration with this is that, you know, Shirky is pretty determined to have some version of this. Maybe it's not going to be exactly what it looks like, but something he is determined to have something. Um, one of the big concerns that we have that I have with it is that there are real no true quality measures in this. It says that there'll be a quality department. It says that MDHS will put together a group, but it doesn't say what it's going to be. I don't really think measuring cholesterol is something that we need to be concerned about as a measurement. I know that they're looking at integration, but I think it needs to be done on a quarterly basis. It needs to be outside of the organization that we're giving money to, and it cannot be at the end of the fiscal year. The big concern I have is that we're going to have this HMO come in, have millions of dollars taken out of the Michigan system for them just to turn around at the end of the one-year contract that says, yeah, it's not working for me. And they have just pillaged millions of dollars out of our system. So I really think that, I, I think that something is going to come as a pilot. I think Shirky is going to get something. But we need to have things in place that if it goes through that there are true quality measurements, there's an outside source that is actually monitoring it, and that it is measurable outcomes. None of the like, these are so generic and vague, I could probably pull the same quality outcomes on an outside organization, just based on, you know, data. Um, but this isn't really anybody that's going to be measuring it. I mean, if we see quality outcome after the first quarter, after the second quarter, after the third quarter starting to tank, we need to be into that health system or that, you know, whoever it's going to be, tell, putting them on a PEP, turning it around. We cannot wait until the end of the year when they submit everything to us to find out that they're one of the worst entities we have. Lori, did you have your hand up? Yes. Um, yeah, in our person served meeting last week, this was discussed, and that's what I was going to put the phases up that they were discussing it. But it also, you know, outside of even mental health and physical health, it it's the people that use other programming that is whether it's LEA, CEO, whatever all those things could be totally cut because they're focusing on the mental and physical health. They're not focusing on the person themselves, which Nick had said of what, what their life is like and what they need in their life. They're not including any of those entities into this three phase program with, especially for those with developmental disabilities too. They're, I said, they're programming everything that they know and enjoy will be gone. Well, I think the phases are upside down. Most of the money that we spend is in that phase three. If we allow an organization to come in and get through phase one and phase two, there are no guarantees that they're going to be able to handle phase three. This is something that they have never worked with. It almost needs to go upside down because if they can't handle phase three, then there is no point in even giving them money to try phase two or the, the first phase. So I, I have concerns about that also because they could actually take out so much money in the first and the second phase. Where are we going to get the money for the third phase? Well, if, if I could just say one thing, Selena, I agree with everything you said, but one, and that's that this, that Stricky's going to get something. Dr. Gordon is no longer with the department. Al Jansen's approach is entirely different than Dr. Gordon's was. In fact, the two people who are most pushing this within the department uh, are both gone. Uh, there is a huge amount of consumer opposition to this, 
And so while Shirky is a very powerful person, I don't take anything from him. Uh, the last two times, because it's really the third time we've been faced with this threat, the last two times, uh, the state association said, well, maybe we need to try to work something out because we can't stop it. But both times we ultimately did stop it. And I don't think third is a, three times a char charm necessarily. I think this is just a very bad idea. There's a lot of evidence from other states that have tried it, that it doesn't work, and that there's a totally different approach, which Jansen has talked about, uh, that's a slower approach to deal with the realities of transitioning, uh, but is one that recognizes the importance of supports and services as well as treatment. I think the reason mental health is put on top instead of uh, uh, developmental or intellectual disabilities is because the intellectual and developmental disabilities are more supports and services where the mental illness, there is a medical piece to it, a, a very large medical piece to it. And coordinating, for instance, psychotropics with uh, heart medications and gallbladder medications is something that needs to be dealt with, but it's not going to be dealt with by handing the money over to the HMOs to get that done. So I, I think it's important that we not assume that we've lost this battle because I don't think we have, uh, but I do think, yes, we need to talk about how to achieve the coordination between the two uh, through a mechanism uh, that we come up with and we're part of developing rather than through this one. Uh, through the chair. Go ahead, Linda. Um, and I just like to say that at the person served uh, meeting, there really is no interest in going along and tweaking, making some tweaks to what they're proposing, that their initial response is to fight this and push it back like um, and have them run off into the woods like they have the other times hopefully um, it's not to, it's not to tweak it I worked in a public system my entire career that corporations tried all over the country to privatize and there are just are some situations that public programs provide and services that there's no profit in. And so it just doesn't work. They, they go away after a while, after they've dismantled your system, your staff went to work for them and people have suffered and services are down and then they give it up because there are, there are situations that there just isn't a profit in. And that's what you get with the for-profit company. Thank you, everybody. Like I said, I shared this information along with uh, the talking points from the associate, association. Um, again, the, they're proposing a phased in model, which would just, you know, it would take money and services away from us slowly over time. And that um, would not work. <laughs> we can't just try to manage part of the system. And then they gave themselves an out here that without being able to achieve measured improvements in the in the first phase, they wouldn't start a next phase. So yeah, there's just all sorts of problems with this. Um, the next fun topic, um, Richard, since you still have you here, um, the standard cost allocation exercises um, that are going on at the state. I shared information um, with, with you via email just before the meeting. And again, the association is pushing back um, primarily based on the, um, how the costs are allocated between the PIHP level and the CMHs. Um, the, the state's working very closely with Milliman and they have one view of how those dollars should be um, counted as administrative. Um, the association is pushing back on that but it will impact our system. Uh, we had our initial meeting internally and we're going to be meeting on a regular basis between now and the end of September because the go live date for us is October 1st. Um, Richard, you wanna provide a little detail about how it's going to impact operationally? Oh, 
at a high level, there's really three, there's kind of these three different things that are happening at the state level. One of them is standard cost allocation, which Dave is mentioning, and, and it's requiring us to capture services and costs um, in uh, the buckets that will allow us to create a cost per service model that is comparable from CMH to CMH. Um, the, the intent is not to force CMHs to act like one another, but in theory, if two CMHs provided the same service in the same way, they should calculate the same cost per service. Um, and so that's going to help inform the department uh, how we are spending funds um, related to services and administration. Um, the other pieces of this, though, um, are other work groups that are intending to use this information to try to estimate future cost of services. It's referred to as the independent rate model um, that they're wanting to implement. Um, and so part of this process will be um, informing kind of that future rate setting process for the system. So we do see a future impact to revenue. So really for us, it's identifying which areas of our operations in how we capture cost and how we capture service data need to be changed to align with this new standard reporting model. Um, and again, like Dave said, we have to start being able to capture those costs um, and capture those services in this defined model starting October 1 uh, of 21. It will impact um, um, like our payroll system, um, the, the financial system on our side and the, the county side. So I've alerted the, the county and Richard's talking to the finance at the, the county side as well. So we'll continue to provide, uh, to provide updates on that. Um, there is a lot more going on, um, but in the interest of time, um, I'll take questions and we'll wrap up my report for now and I'll continue to provide like email updates. And if you would like a study session, happy to help coordinate. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Questions, comments for Dave right now? All right, I don't see any, I don't hear any. So we will move on. Thank you, Dave. We know where to find you. <laughs> There's a lot going on. <laughs> All right, we will move on to other possible agenda items. And we have four presentations. One is from CMMI, another from Quality Department, another from CAC, and another from Substance Use Services. I will take a motion to receive and file all of them and we will go through them one by one. So take a motion to receive and file all the presentations. So move, Burke. Support, Philip. Motion from Megan, support from Lori. And with that, we will start with Carrie Timmons from CMMI. Well, thank you, Carrie, for, for being here this evening. Um, if you recall, the board did ask for uh, uh, to hear from providers. Um, so Christina helped us put the word out. Um, and Carrie is our first one. So Carrie, I will stop sharing the screen. In case you have a presentation. Okay, well, I wanna thank you all for uh, allowing me to come speak and, and share a little bit about what we do. I will say that um, this has been going out. Luckily, I got kicked out a couple times prior to it being my turn to speak. So I'm hoping it won't happen while I'm supposed to be speaking. Um, but if it does, I, I will come back as quickly as possible. Um, I am from CMMI or otherwise known as Case Management of Michigan. Uh, I am the executive director and I've been there for almost 20 years in various roles from case manager, clinical director, and now executive director. Um, we provide outpatient mental health services to adults with chronic and persistent mental health uh, issues. They're often considered treatment resistant. Um, they'll have multiple failed placements, numerous hospitalizations. 
Uh, and that leads them to be placed out of their county of origin and into um, often somewhere on the west side of the state. We're located in Kalamazoo. Uh, we currently have contracts with Macomb County and 15 other community mental health organizations. So everything you guys were talking about before, all your concerns. I usually when I get a referral from somebody, if it's not somebody that we're used to dealing with, they'll say to me, Carrie, I don't even know where to start. This is hard. This one's hard. And I'll say, it's okay. We do hard. Um, that How can we help them? How can we help them help themselves? What can we do? Um, so I, uh, more formally here, I have a little guide here so I don't get off topic. Our, our goal is to provide effective services for individuals that are also cost effective to the CMH. So one of the big things we use for that because our clients often come to us and they've had lots of hospitalizations is we look at hospitalization rates. Um, and because that, that says that the person's symptoms are being better managed and it creates cost savings for the people people that were contracted, which, which is the CMH. So that's one of the big things we look at. Um, so I pulled the data for Macomb specifically so that I could speak to what th this means for you guys. Um, and if we look at a year prior to um, having services with case management in Michigan, uh, the average Macomb client was, it. this is our, just our clients, not overall clients, but just clients that come to Case Management in Michigan. Um, they average two admissions for psychiatric inpatient care and spent an average of 208 days in the hospital, which that's a lot of time, not in your home, um, in the hospital. In 2019, the Macomb clients that were with us averaged uh, 0 0.5 admissions to the hospital, so it's less than one, and spent a total of 1.5 days in the hospital. So you can see that that's a, that's a huge reduction. Um, and am I still with everybody? So far, so good. Okay, all right. I was like, I'm not sure sometimes Sometimes I don't freeze up, but everybody else does, but they can still hear, but I'm talking, so I don't know. Um, so that's a huge reduction. That really equates to a 99.3% reduction in hospital days, which is a cost saving to Macomb about $6.1 million in a year. So I think that that, that gives, um, that, that tells us we're meeting our goal, right? If, if we're doing that. So then people often ask me after I, if they see the data, they'll say, Carrie, how do you do that? And it's, it's not complicated or hard. Um, it comes down to one word relationship. We do things a little bit differently. Um, we talk about our. Or that is what we want to do. So we spend a lot of time with our clients. We see our clients on average two to four times in a month. Um, and it's really a time to engage with them, build trust with them, support them. And we really want to remain curious while we're with them. We want to find out what they're thinking, what have their experiences been, what might be keeping them from talking to us or wanting to be there. A lot of times by the time we get them, they're angry, they're frustrated and understandably so after going through all that. Uh, so we work with that. I, I asked a client, I said, you've had other case managers, you know, what's, what do we do differently? What, what is, help me understand the differences. And they said, well, you ask more important questions. You talk to me, not just staff. Okay, that, that's, that will get you, I guess, farther along with somebody. We also really work to collaborate with the direct care staff, the home managers, everybody that's on the 
recruitment team, but the direct care staff and the home managers are the individuals that spend the most time with our clients. And they tend to kind of know what's going on. They know what the, the interactions in the house. And although they can't tell us everything, sometimes they're like, look, the other day that was really a peer issue. That wasn't them having a bad day. Um, and so it really provides us a lot of insight and a lot of input, but that of course takes time, right? We have to, that's part of that investing in time and building. The, uh, a home manager said to her, you know, you're the only case manager that I actually see or talk to. And I don't, I don't, I know other people have said similar things in the past. Maybe this is a little bit more, um, COVID related, but, but still, you know, we show up and, um, that, that is at our heart, what we want to do. We want to keep showing up for somebody after they've been through all this treatment, <laughs> if I can put in a near quote, and it is treatment and it does work for a lot of people. Um, but there are those individuals that are treatment resistant and they didn't ask to be the sickest. They didn't do anything to get a mental illness. And um, we have to remember that often they're grieving a lot of the losses that we all take for granted. The loss of having a family, a loss of having a spouse, the loss of having your own apartment or your own house, um, going to school, having a career. It's not that they didn't have these dreams. It's just that they got so sick that they never got a chance to pursue them. And so I think that that's one of the things we always have to keep in mind that we're dealing with somebody that was just like us prior to getting sick. And so I want to, I want you guys to have time to answer questions and I could really get into um, some of my theories and beliefs on the system and what we could do to change it. But I, I won't do that today because that's not what I was asked to come here and talk to, <laughs> talk to you guys about. Um, but I'll just say that it takes showing up with compassion and curiosity that is genuine um, and, and just caring about those folks. And that is what makes our numbers work. Thank you, any, any questions? Mary, thank you for the presentation and you're exactly spot on. The smallest thing like showing up is so impactful and I appreciate you spreading that message to, to us and, and to everybody that you're serving for us. So anybody on the board have questions or comments for Carrie? Oh, I might be losing you guys. I think he came back. We okay. lost for a second. <laughs> anybody with a question or comment? All right, I don't see any. I don't oh, hear just any. Want to thank oh, Carrie. Just Ryan, want to, go ahead. Just want to thank Carrie for showing up and, and presenting. <laughs> Appreciate it. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to, to reach out to me and, and ask. Um, like I said, I, I have I have ideas and I, I just I really appreciate what I heard from you guys. I think you're going in the right directions. We got to put the people first. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks for being here tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you for all you guys do. All right, next up is going to be a presentation from the quality department and Ambrosia Jackson. Dave, did you want to kick it off first? He says no. Ambrosia, oh, Ambrosia's, tell you. Ambrosia's ready to go. So Okay. <laughs> Thank each and every one of you individually for allowing me to um, speak tonight and to introduce to some and um, update others on the great work that is being done by the Mental Health Disparity Committee. I'd like to also thank Cindy Kono um, for trusting me with advancing this initiative and both my co-chairs of Crystal Buizzi and also Stephanie Lang for um, the assistance that they provide me daily. So what the Mental Health Disparity Committee is here in Macomb County at CMH, um, we are a committee that is charged with um, recognizing, with identifying, and um, with analyzing disparities within our network. So the principle by which we stand is our mission, and that is here on the screen. And um, so what we are charged with doing is educating and finding out where disparities are present, identifying barriers, 
um, to see why those disparities are present and then to ensure that those are dismantled. As a part of that, we have like these pillars as a part of the principles, which we would like to call responsibilities. So we have a responsibility within this committee to oversee initiatives that um, are aimed toward decreasing disparities within the mental health uh, network and also to progress uh, with documentation and a continuous uh, de um, decrease of those. Also, um, with uh, supporting any type of policy or, or practices that we may have in place with pragmatic mechanisms or methodologies that we can support to decrease, um, to increase, my apologies, access to care and also close the gap to care. What this may look like is um, introducing and furthering, introducing class standards and classes, the culturally and linguistically competent supports. So for a lot of us, maybe when we go to the doctor, we see um, a informational flashed over a screen and we may see that information in a number of different languages. That's what we need to do. We need to reach um, people where, where they are and give uh, a, a number of different um, avenues where populations that um, are minorities or populations where there has been identified um, disparity, more support. So identifying ways to close the gap to care, working with people and providers within our network um, to do that are top of mind for the disparity committee. And all of this, um, we have, the um the privilege of an honor absolutely of reporting out to the governing body so the the board and state and federal programs um if we shall go forth and receive monies for um, our efforts here in macomb county we have two very large overarching goals and um we have quite a few initiatives that get us to achieving these goals and um, so fostering partnerships with mental and behavioral health providers, um, different community leaders and, and um, government agencies, uh, which we have done and on the next slide, uh, we'll see. We have learned that um, educating individuals and um, as my friend says, we don't know what we don't know. And a lot of people, um, we, we don't know what we don't know, which is where implicit bias lies. And I always like to encourage individuals to take one of the Harvard implicit bias um, scales or uh, measurements and, and often individuals are surprised at their results. And they have, I think, 14 different measurements in there around race, around ableism, around uh, uh, weight, and also things like um, religion. And just to take it and you'll, you'll see, and most people are surprised at their results. So just partnering with these different um, community agencies to see how we can um, express how we would like to collaborate with them to kind of get the services that we can offer to them and also to try to understand the specific populations more. And our goal with that is to increase our penetration rate among those specific populations and provide services to them. The second goal here um, would be more around fostering those positive uh, relationship within our community. Um, some of this took kind of like a halt with COVID because a lot of the second goal here has to do with outreach, but we have been creative in the ways that we do outreach. It has entailed a lot of Zoom meetings, um, a lot of uh, being asked to speak at uh, staff meetings for specific organizations and just to ensure that uh, we are providing population specific services and also spreading awareness. So let's talk about the good stuff. And the good stuff is what have we done so far? So um, in, in January, as you can see here, we were able to offer a training on implicit bias, intergroup anxiety and awareness. And we have coined that um, as being um, uh, the, the, we have coined that and, and titled as being um, able to explore your blind spot. Mark Kilgore, um, who I think may be on the call today, came in in February and he presented on um, SUD services and where recovery and community meet. 
All of these are informational sessions. Um, we don't like to call them trainings. It's really not a training. It's an informational session to kind of learn about the specific communities where disparity may be present. And so we bring in experts from our field and um, to have present. And we also try to ask how we can be of service to them and also introduce their program to our, to our system if they're not already familiar. So of course, CARE was already very familiar uh, with, our, with our system. So the February session and uh, quite a few of these sessions were birthed out of the people we serve indicating that they wanted more services in these areas. And the SUD services was certainly one of them. Another one was the LGBTQ services, which we'll be highlighting in June. In March, we had Dave Garcia, another Tri-County um, partner come in and speak about the indigenous population. We repeated January's training in April. Um, I am excited about May as uh, Malkia Newman uh, will be coming to speak about the disparities in African-American community as it pertains to mental health. Um, in June, we see here our very own Anwar, and we have partnered with DNOM to talk about disparities that are present in the deaf and hard of hearing community. And June happens to be Pride Awareness Month, so we'll have a presentation as well with the LGBTQ community. We know here in Macomb that we have a large population of Arab Americans, and so we have partnered with Mona who will be speaking about the refugee and Arab American population and their um, disparities that are present in the mental health population there. And um, in August, we'll also have our very own uh, Jeff, uh, who is our veteran navigator, who will be coming and speaking about disparities and understanding veteran culture. We have partnered with the county, um, McCombs. Um, he is the director of community action um, Ernest, and we have partnered with him to bring a new training in September where we will be collaborating and speaking about the services present in both the mental and physical health sides of um, our county. And so that will be fun. I think it's also important to note that um, each quarter we have, we partner with our tri-county partners to bring toward educational opportunities to uh, present to our entire network collaboratively. So we know here that we are about 47% of the population um, in the Tri-County area of Michigan. And so we are working toward one goal to reduce disparity in Oakland, Wayne and Macomb. Uh, the training department and myself have collaborated with um, the University of Michigan to have trained the trainers on implicit bias. And we have uh, quite a few exciting things coming up. And I have just been excited to um, do this work. And our goal is to reduce disparity overall. We have gotten information and data from the state that outlines a few specific areas where we have disparity. And so we're focusing our numbers on those areas, but we are addressing any area where disparity may be present. Is there any questions for me? Thanks, Ambrosia. Great presentation. Any board members with questions? Megan's clapping, Dave's clapping. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions for Ambrosia? Ryan, go ahead. Ryan's still on mute. I'm just curious. Thank you, Ambrosia. I'm just curious if the Chaldean community is participating in any way. Yes, so we definitely um, have, I have a contact for, um, for, for access. And so that is something that we will be collaborating with. And I'm also reaching out to Corey. I forget his last name in this moment, but he, he is one of those individuals that are well known um, in the community. And we are working with them to, to bring um, a training as well. We had quite the ambitious um, strategic plan, um, everyone. So we are learning that um, the work that we may have planned to put in our first year may have, you know, have to take two or three years to um, represent all populations or sectors um, present. But we are absolutely, we have that written into our plan. So that is definitely in our strategic plan in our, in our charter. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Ryan. Nick, did you have a question? 
I just wanted to thank Ambrosia for the presentation and to say I'm particularly pleased to see you've got Malkia coming in. I've, yes. worked, I've worked with her for quite a while in a number of capacities right now. We're both on the Mental Health Association Board of Directors, and I think you're going to find her uh, not only very informative, but also very entertaining. Absolutely. So, I've worked with Malkia for many years. So uh, I know very well the gift that is Malkia, and I'm excited for everyone to be under the sound of her voice. Yeah. And you know what I mean, Nick, when I say under the sound of her voice. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Can I have her sing it for us? Tell her I, tell her yes. I made that request. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Linda. Any other questions or comments for Ambrosia? All right. Thank you very much, Ambrosia. Really appreciate the update. Next, we will move on to the CAC. I see Lori is here. I don't think Dave wants to start this one either. We'll just, <laughs> Lori, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that you all received a copy of um, uh, what I had intended to use as a presentation tonight. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, like a lot of us, are having a lot of technical issues today that I have come to the end of my ability to figure out. So um, what I'm going to do today is really just talk to you, um, which may come off a little better as well anyway. So um, um, many of you know about uh, the Citizens Advisory Council already. Um, oh, here we go. He's got, Dave's got it up. Um, so anyway, many of you know about the Citizens Advisory Council, the board, the mental health board established the CAC in Macomb County some 30 years ago, nearly, um, to be um, an opportunity for primary and secondary consumers to have access to the leadership of CMH, um, much as um, our providers and uh, uh, folks in our political system have access to us. Our board had the vision to want our consumers, to our consumers and their families to have a way of uh, having input in the things that we do. So the CAC um, has been that for many years. Um, I do want to express my congratulations to uh, Mark Kilgore, who is your new board member, who used to be a member of the CAC. He is carrying on a tradition that makes me personally very proud. Um, there have been a number of CAC members who have, I would say, graduated on. Um, to be board members, and um, that uh, always pleases me. It's my hope that the CAC um, is a good uh, preparation for that. So thank you. Um, I also want to let you know, um, you know that our, our former CAC chair uh, has made the decision to um, retire and enjoy his life. So um, we wish him well. And we did do a resolution for him last month. Thank you so much. Um, and, but we do have a new chair um, who is Pat Haver and she is a mother uh, of a consumer. I did invite her to join us tonight, uh, but she was not able to do that. So you will be hearing from her um, in the future. Um, here's the, what is the CAC? We talked a little bit about that. Again, purpose being to have an avenue for families and consumers to have um, a way to have access to leadership and to have meaningful input in how the system functions. So um, while we help those folks, uh, our CAC members with their individual needs, their purpose as a group, of course, is to help with the system um, and to help us keep, uh, keep our system family and consumer friendly, if you will. So, uh, so they are mostly, our CAC members are mostly uh, connected to other groups, uh, be they NAMI, ARC, um, whatever, whatever it may be, uh, whether it's even their local churches or synagogues, or I'm looking for people always who are out there with others um, so that they can help to spread the word about the availability of mental health services uh, in Macomb County. So um, one thing that I've, I've not been in this position before, but because of how, um, just how things have gone in the last 30 days, 
In the last 30 days, we've lost three members, um, which now puts us at five members, which is, uh, which is below what we should have. The charter for the CAC established by the board does uh, uh, stipulate to eight to 17 members. Uh, but as I said, this just happened in the last 30 days between the um, retirement of our previous chair. Uh, we had a member move out of the county and then we had another uh, person that uh, was off for other reasons. So now uh, I am, I and the CAC. Now I, I'm speaking today as the CAC liaison, but I don't mean to speak for them, but um, we are looking for in the process of adding uh, new members, and I do have a couple folks that are interested. I, I or we, we being myself and the chair, will bring those members to the board at a future meeting for your um, review and approval. Um, I would like to bring them all as a group. I do have at the moment two and a third one potentially, and then I'd like to bring on a couple of more. So within the next, I would imagine 30 or 60 days, uh, we will be coming back to you with some recommendations of folks to add. Um, and that is, those are the two biggest things, the, the changeover in the uh, leadership with the um, chair and the fact that at this moment we are um, actively looking for new folks. So um, this is my plug. Um, if there is anyone on the board or anyone out there listening that has someone in mind or knows someone who um, is using or has used our service and, and you feel they would be a good advocate for us and for our system, please send them my way and myself and the chair will talk to them and encourage them to be involved. Now, um, I just wanted, oh, uh, can you just roll back a little bit? There we go. I just wanted to give you a little bit of what they've been talking about and what's important to them, um, important to the CAC in recent uh, weeks and months, especially during the pandemic. Um, the CAC, the members are very interested in our system um, helping to find ways to get our consumers vaccinated. Um, obviously, I don't think anyone wants to force anything on anybody who doesn't want to be vaccinated, but there is terrific concern on the CAC for our vulnerable folks who are very vulnerable to the illness and then um, may have trouble accessing the vaccine in the ways that uh, some of the rest of us are able to do that. So they've been uh, encouraging us and talking about that. Um, they are also always involved in quality initiatives, um, satisfaction surveys. There is a member of the quality team that always comes and addresses the CAC as well. And they do have a keen interest in that. And again, they're very interested in um, not so much the technicalities of things, but how it hits the road. Um, with the families that we support, so, and the consumers, so, and they are very um, excited about, it's hard to meet Ambrosia and not be excited about what she's excited about, so they've become very excited about the disparity and diversity trainings, um, and they are very excited about promoting the use of my strength. I think, I believe that all the board members have, um, had an opportunity to learn a little bit about My Strength, um, which is the web-based uh, mental health self-help resource that uh, Macomb County uh, makes available to the community. Um, the CAC has had training on that, and many of them are very interested in promoting its use and have helped us to do that, especially again during the pandemic. It's a, um, a something that they've started to use and found the value, so now they're uh, helping us to spread that word. So. Um, that is a very, very quick overview of what's going on. If anyone has any questions, again, I'm happy to, you know, answer any questions. Or again, if you know anyone who you think might be interested or might be good, please uh, send them my way. Thank you, Lori. Thank you for the presentation. Any board members with questions or comments for Lori? Possibly five or six names for board members off the top of your heads. <laughs> All right, hearing and seeing no comments or questions. Lori, thank you very much. We know where to find you if we have suggestions or questions. Okay. Thank you. 
Next up is our last presentation on substance use services from our director, Helen Klinger. Helen, go ahead. Okay. Good evening and thank you everyone for giving me the opportunity to be here again tonight. Um, Dave, do you want me to just go ahead and do it or you wanna scroll through for me? I'll be your, uh, your assistant. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I have had the pleasure of coming in the past and talking about the responsibilities of the substance use department and gave you some overview already on some of our prevention and treatment services. So tonight I really wanted to focus on more of our recovery services to kind of give you a well-rounded picture of the different things that we offer to people in our community. So next slide, please. So one of the things that we are able to provide is peer recovery support services. So with peer recovery support services, we contract uh, primarily with CARE of Southeastern Michigan, who started um, providing peer recovery coach services for us several years ago. We had initiated services under a small grant with Sacred Heart many years ago where we had two part-time peers. And now I think uh, since we've moved over to CARE and we've had other grant fundings and wonderful opportunities to see advancements with this service, I believe we're at um, you know, 40 or so peers dedicated to our service. And I think they have maybe, it could be 70 as, as many now in their agency. So we do have a lot of peers um, in this specific program that I'm going to be referring to, but we also have peers that work at our residential treatment facilities and our medication assisted treatment services who are part of the overall treatment team at a program. So um, they are providing supports and services. Uh, some of uh, the things that is important to know is that people providing peer services are in long-term recovery from substance use disorder and they use that experience to um, help provide problem solving skills and advocacy to the clients that they serve. Uh, they do this by helping address issues that the person may be experiencing, such as um, ability in finding community resources, addressing relapse issues, and helping identify goals uh, for achievement. And we could go on to the next slide. We are able to, um, some of the qualifications for the individual who's in that role is that they are in long-term recovery, as I mentioned, and they also must be certified as either um, a peer recovery coach through the Connecticut Community Addiction Recovery Program, the CCAR uh, program. That had been the national standard for many, many years and is still a very strong standard that you'll find across many states where it offers a full week training for individuals and really builds on multiple pathways to recovery and knowing how to navigate and help people in their recovery journey. Um, more recently in the last couple of years, um, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services also developed a certified peer recovery coach program um, that they made specific and wrote into the Medicaid policy. So to use uh, peer recovery coaches on a reimbursement under Medicaid we need people who have gone through that training again, very similar in that it's a week long training. Uh, they, they go through that process and they um, take a test in the end. The difference with that group is there is a requirement that they're already employed within a program before they can go to the training versus the CCAR. It could be anybody in recovery is welcome to attend. And the state did have some um, restrictions in that you had to be somebody who's gone through the public system to be a recovery coach. And we have heard word from the department that that restriction will be removed because we have many wonderful people who have um, gone through different means but know the public system very well. So we didn't wanna um, go against the philosophy of many pathways to recovery by having that restriction in place. Then also you may hear that many of our therapists are certified through the Michigan, Associ the Michigan Certification Board of Addiction Professionals or MCBAP. So MCBAP several years ago, they all also began to offer certification for peer recovery coaches. So there's a variety of uh, mechanisms for a peer to become certified and eligible to work within the public health system. So we could go to the next slide there. Uh, focuses that our peer recovery coach really looks at that we provide through our contracts 
are on, uh, we started off with looking at services to help people as they move through the different levels of care. So many times a person who goes into a residential treatment center and then, um, you know, we are looking to have them continue their care with an aftercare or outpatient provider upon discharge, we found we lost many people that um, making that tr transition from one level of care to another or from one program to another program or provider um, left some gaps in our system. So peer recovery coaches, uh, we engage with them to work with clients while they're in the residential treatment program, meet and greet and kind of talk to them about their options and opportunities and then help encourage to get them to that next level of care. In our last fiscal year, we served just under 400 individuals, which is a little bit lower, uh, primarily due to COVID time. But even though um, the numbers were a little bit lower, that still accounted for more than 10,000 units of service or 15 minute increments of time. We also have a wonderful program going that we were able to start under one of our grant projects and have been able to continue under grant funding is our Project Assert. And Project Assert has peers who go into the go into the hospital emergency departments and work with people that who have been identified as either having an opiate overdose or known to have a substance use disorder. And so they go in and they do screening, brief intervention and referral to treatment, SBIRD model, and really encourage people um, to look at the issues and problems that they're currently experiencing. And the goal is to engage them with treatment and care. So in the last fiscal year, we were able to serve uh, just under 1,400 individuals in that uh, line item. We also have peers that began working in our opiate health home project as we spoke about in a different presentation. And currently uh, that is covering more than 375 people since the beginning of October. So we're very excited about that and we're hearing great success stories uh, from our peers in those settings where individuals are really be being provided with supports to get employment, get their driver's license back and help um, have drug-free babies born while participating in their program. So some really good early stories that we're already learning about. We also have peers working in our recovery centers and I'll talk about those in just a minute. And another project that we also help support is through um, the jails or correction system. So we have peers that work with Macomb County Jail, the Michigan Department of Corrections that offers a medication assisted treatment program and uh, some of the courts. And so between those two, we've served over um, 125 people in that project as well. So we can go to the next slide. So recovery home service is also another area that we cover under re recovery services. And so these are alcohol and drug free living environments. Um, it's peer led and there are stacked activities and structured operations and they help an individual um, get a safe place to live and have some stability with people with the same goal and in, um, intention in mind so that they have safe, sober living environments uh, in their early phases of recovery. Uh, the homes, we have a requirement that they must uh, adhere to the Michigan Alliance of Recovery Residencies or MARS standards, which is um, the local branch of the National Association. So with our recovery homes, uh, clients um, have to be receiving funded substance use treatment as part of a condition of being eligible for the recovery home because they have to be actively engaged in the recovery. They need to attend weekly house meetings. They have to seek and maintain employment and also abstain from all substance use. So in the last fiscal year, we served 529 individuals uh, through our recovery housing contracts. We have eight providers doing that service and we have 32 different homes that are available throughout the county. The other recovery service that we have uh, is provided through two recovery community centers. Um, these focus on helping individuals in their recovery journey. They offer a variety of different services and supports, um, things ranging from educational and support, uh, social supports to um, recovery coaching. It may be things that include um, job readiness skills, employment seeking, resume building. Uh, both centers offer yoga. Um, there's a, a variety of um, programming that occurs and that's eligible 
to anybody who has a, who is in recovery, their family members, or you know anybody who has an interest in in that arena. We go to the next slide. And those are our two um, contracted recovery centers. One is through CARE, through the, uh, the uh, Recovery United Community Center, and the other is Live Right. Um, and that one is, so we have Frazier and we have Roseville. And then I did just wanna add, um, we also help support uh, Project Box, which is a recovery advocacy group that works to influence uh, public policy and substance use prevention, treatment and recovery services. And they do many activities uh, that help engage people in healthy, substance-free activities and fun things, as well as to advocate with um, government and those who have influence on policy. So just wanted to give you an overview there. And if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Thanks, Helen, for the presentation. Any board members with questions or comments? Pretty quiet. Megan's clapping again. <laughs> All right. No questions, no comments. Thank you, Helen. We also know where to find you if we have any going forward. Thank you very Thank you. much. All right. With that, we have completed all of our presentations and we have a motion and support to receive and file. So, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Presentations have been received and filed. Are there any board members with any items to bring up? I just wanted to briefly say uh, uh, to our new and returning officers, congratulations and condolences. And <laughs> I express my gratitude for your willing to take on the additional responsibility. I know how busy all of you are. So thanks. Thanks for doing this. I have one, Phil, but I just want to say something about Nick's comment. Nick, for the entire next year, you can say you didn't vote for Phil. Oh, I did vote for Phil. Because you was, came in late. Uh, no, that's not true. I came, I came <laughs> I'm just kidding. At today's <laughs> meeting. I came in just in time to, to while you were still. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, good. Screen. I came oh, in. Good. I to vote. Good on the election of officers. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Linda. Great, great. Uh, my comment is. Go ahead. The Community Mental Health Association of Michigan, whoops, is um, probably going to be in person. And they're going to try to do it in person in October. And so the save the date is um, the conference is Monday and Tuesday, but on Monday, the meetings start like 7, 7.30. So Sunday the, is the travel day. So that's Sunday, October 24th through uh, the 26th. And if you've never been, um, and you know, we've been ha uh, having just virtual in over a year now. Um, I, what I found when I started going was the, the networking is very important, but you just don't even know what you don't know till you get to see all those workshops and they have board works, which tell you all about being a board member and you get to hear the experiences and programs of other counties. So I highly recommend it and uh, ask that you save the date. Thank you, Linda. Any other board members? All right, I just wanted to mention real quickly that now that there's new officers, that means there's gonna be new committees, new members on the committees. So I will be reaching out to everybody over the next few days into early next week with all the committees, just seeing what everybody's interested in, who wants to chair what, who would like to be vice chair. Um, and for the newer board members, I'm going to provide a little description on what each committee is, what we do there to, to help you guys out because what I started, it was recipient rights committee. I don't know what that means. So <laughs> we'll try to do our best to help you out the best of our ability. So um, I will be in contact with you all over the next few days, like I said, and we'll go from there. I want everybody to be happy with what they want and, and get committees that they're interested in and learning more about what we're doing and helping the people that we serve. So be on the lookout for that. Sandy's gonna help me with that as well. So. 
Anybody else? Last call. Yeah, right. Phil, I just have a, I have a comment. This is Mark Kilbar. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, I've just been attending all those meetings. I thought that was part of my obligation. <laughs> yeah. Recipients' rights and uh, what was the program and budget. So I've been on every meeting so far. <laughs> and you're more than welcome to do it. We just we just narrow down who can vote and who can, you know, watch and learn. So <laughs> and thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. <laughs> all right. Anybody else? All right. Seeing none, we'll move on to the final hearing of the public. Anybody from the public wishing to speak? You have five minutes. Give us your name and address. It can be about any item. Um, make sure you're off mute or raise your hand. Um, we will start with Sean from CEO. Sean, go ahead. Hi, uh, good night. Or, <laughs> good night. <laughs> good, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm with CEO. Um, I'm in Macomb Township right now, here to deliver the CEO report. Um, for our person served update, CEO has more than 115 persons served physically returning to our Clinton Township, Anchorville, Mount Clemens, and Washington buildings. Um, CEO continues to follow all CDC and state level guidelines to ensure safe, clean, and optimal facilities. Our telehealth program continues to be a success and we have already gained another three new persons served just in the last month. As well, telehealth is expanding its curricular activity by adding in new classes throughout the week. <clears throat> For our community center update, um, just recently on Monday afternoon, a random motorist that was under the influence crashed into the side of our Mount Clemens location. Uh, destroying the main office and some of the conference room. Thankfully, this was after closing hours and there was no person served or staff in the building. And the driver walked away from the accident as well. Uh, currently, we're waiting on the building inspector to come survey it before anybody can enter and anything else can be done. Um, now that our Mount Clemens person served have been attending our Clinton Township location as well um, as the staff, our Mount Clemens and Clinton Township just got a donation of a high-end style uh, coffee maker and they are starting to make a coffee club, handing out muffins, cookies, and bagels, um, varying between things each week. And then lastly, at our Clinton Township location, they're investing in upgrading our security system to monitor the, monitor the property and its comings and goings. Um, that's all I got for the night. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for the update. and. Glad everybody is okay after that accident. Anybody else from the public wishing to speak? Anybody else from the public going twice? Third and final call for hearing of the public. All right, hearing and seeing none, we will close hearing of the public and I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion from Dana, support from Nick, I think. All in favor, <laughs> signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. I think you should say all in favor.